Okay, let's uh, go ahead and get started. So uh, item one on the agenda, as always, is agenda bashing. So uh, if uh, if anyone has any um, anything to add to the agenda, um, now's the best time to uh, to do so. So uh, well, I'm speaking here, so I'm new on the group, and uh, thank you. Thank you guys to inviting me on short notice here and I'm happy to join. And it was an idea to have five to 10 minutes about a use case we are doing with a more or less home drawn um, service mesh or network service mesh, if anyone interested. So we, we can probably add a, a spot on the uh, use case mapping um, below if, for you to talk about. Uh, um, I, I, I think that, did, did you, I think that was already added, right? Is, I think I saw someone put that on there. Exactly, it was a quick hack uh, just uh, four, minutes, four minutes ago uh, before the call to add some use case drawing to the use case map. It's not final, obviously, it's just uh, sketched in there. But if we want, we can share the use case even as a call here and talk about what we're thinking of we doing for this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think that, that would be good to I think that would be good. Yeah. 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 And uh, of, course, of course, last week we thought probably we'll have a detailed discussion on the use case document. And I think this comes handy for you to present too. That'll be great. Yep. Yeah. I'll talk about yeah. it too. And Prem, I, I agree. I was hoping that this we might spend the majority of this meeting on the use case stuff. Right. Right. Yeah, like I, I personally think that uh, right now the most important thing uh, that we can focus on in uh, network service mesh is working out what those use cases are because that really will de drive the development. So I'm happy to devote uh, the majority of time to uh, to use case and, and use case discussion. Um, Okay, so is, is there anything else that needs to be on the agenda or should we, should we continue on? I'm good, if everyone else is good. Nothing yeah, for me. I think silence is, uh, is good to move on. Okay, so the, the next thing is there is a, uh, for those who are attending the Open Source Summit in the end of August in Vancouver, there is a cloud uh, native network function seminar that is gonna be held the day before the summit starts. So the summit itself is on Wednesday through Friday on August 29th through 31st. Uh, they hold a couple mini sessions, I guess you could call them, or workshops on Monday and Tuesday before. And so the Tuesday before uh, is, the, is the seminar. So um, feel free to Join in. Um, I believe you have to register for it when you when you register for your open source summit pass. Um, and uh, as a and one of the topics uh, is going to be about uh, network service mesh, or at least there'll be some discussion on it. Um, okay, so. So I'm trying to understand what this is on the agenda, a, uh, AI's uh, or Al's review, one one or the other. So, uh, oh yeah, AI's. Yeah. So I, I I actually so for those first two, I actually opened up issues. Um, I, I I looked this morning and and I wasn't it wasn't clear who was going to do that, so I just did it. So I put links to them there too. Okay. I, I do have to apologize. I have not gotten to the the AI assigned to me um, from last week. Um, about you know getting you know name safe space inside the pod, um, I, I will go ahead and, and get that up there on the wiki. I just haven't had a chance to do it this week. Okay, so so much better with it saying action items. <laughs> AI is way even, over. Even though we do have an L on the call, I, I do I do feel <laughs> your pain. Um. <laughs> so I apologize for that. So, anyways. Um, so the action items, uh, I, so at least as far as I know, nobody's gotten to, uh, to verifying the ability to change the CNI driver. Uh, there certainly has been no, uh, no changes on it in the past two hours that the issue was created. 
Um, but I was, I'm pretty sure someone will get to that. If anyone wants to take ownership, uh, by, by all means do so. Um, let's see. Actually, that'd probably be a good idea. If, uh, if anyone wants to take ownership, uh, add yourself on the agenda and we'll assign it to you on GitHub as well. Uh, and, and to be clear, like this is an open source community. We all get that every that all the action items you take are aspirations, and and so don't don't feel like you're signing in blood when you sign up for a thing. Um, you know, just you know, do it if you can, and if you can't, let folks know it's up for grabs again. Yeah, I'm perfectly I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that, and and in fact, uh, don't be surprised if you take an action item and then someone else uh, completes it on your behalf. Yeah, that's also <laughs> totally cool. So, um, although it probably won't happen for the, for the more complex ones, but for the simple ones, that certainly can happen. Um, okay, so let's see, open a GitHub issue to, ref, uh, to verify container runtimes, and so there's the issue was created. Uh, as add to document in the wiki the, how to get, how, getting the namespace from inside the pod. Um, I don't recall seeing anything on the wiki yesterday, so unless you added it between last night and now. No, that, that's, that's what I said just a few minutes ago. I, I, I have not gotten it done yet, and I apologize. Um, I, I, I will attempt to get to that. I've, I've got a bunch of things that have been backing up for this afternoon that people have been asking for around this stuff. So yeah, definitely. Okay, so we'll, we'll circle around with that later on. Uh, no problem. Um, Prem, uh, sent the poll off to the mailing list. Um, yeah, uh, so I can probably quickly give an update on the current status just for the benefit of all. Um, so until now we have 17 responses uh, and then out of which uh, uh, we have uh, close to um, seven responses uh, that said no. The remaining 10 people have said yes. Uh, so which means from a majority perspective, it is still uh, leaning towards the current time slot. Um, so I'll probably send out an email uh, we, to announce. We should probably talk about that a little bit more because I think the whole point of sort of getting the yes and no was not to sort of vote on the time slot per se, right. but to figure out do we actually have a problem with yes. And I, I I would tend to feel that 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 seven out of seventeen responses saying there is a problem probably means mm -hmm. there's a problem. Um, mm -hmm. That does does that does that match how other people are reading the the situation? Yeah, I would say seven out of 17 is a big enough fraction to be concerned yeah. about. <clears throat> yeah. And Close then, to 40%, yep. Yeah, it, it, it's quite concrete. So, yeah. um, and I, I know you'd made a comment, Frederick, about um, the, uh, about people not getting to weigh in on times if they said uh, they were okay with the time slot. Do we want to try and just run a quick doodle poll uh, for a new time slot? And we could include the current time slot in that doodle poll. Um, you know, so that we can get a sense of like, you know, where everything stands. But yeah, that's what I thought we were going to do. That, that would make most sense. Yeah, because yeah, I, I feel like we're, we're losing information on that. Like I'm, I'm personally, I, I'm open for, for this time, but I'm open for other times as well. And we lose. Right. That, so uh, that I think so. some kind of weighted voting would be best, like give everyone three votes or something. I mean, that's the way they usually solve this kind of problem. Well, Hello, Doodle will do that. But, uh, Doodle, Doodle does that. Doodle definitely does that for us. Um, oh, cool. Effectively, it lets everybody, yeah, everybody so, indicate when they can make, and then we figure out what, what's the best solution for the group. I, I guess cool. I meant weighted. So for some people, you know, sometimes are doable, but more or less, more, more or less painful. If do, we we have, give, do we have a tool that we could use for that? So far, the numbers are small enough. Just manual analysis of results would be doable so one other thing is uh, we uh, we also had another early doodle pool probably uh, i can do a quick correlation on what were the times there and then try to see if we can i, I think uh, the earlier doodle pool though was a little more restricted in time because my big recollection was it was restricted enough in time that literally none of the slots proposed in the last doodle poll were times that i right. could make um right. they, you know but but i think the the set of times that you were suggesting more recently on the, the, the poll, if you actually did click no and go through, um, were a little bit broader uh, in, in terms of the, the, the possible times. 
Okay. Uh, I see what you're saying, Ed. So one thing what I can do is I can probably remove that restriction irrespective of whether yes or no. People can go ahead and then do it. But uh, that by that way, everyone expresses their time. Yeah, we, we, we just got a comment as well in the chat uh, from, uh, pardon if I get the name wrong, uh, from Lucina. Uh, suggesting uh, Google Forms, saying the Volk co-op had used it for uh, weighted voting. So uh, that might be another solution to look into. Sure, we can look at that, yep. All right. Question. Real quick question here. Prem, you've been extremely generous with your time in trying to coordinate the, the meeting. Right, right. But if I were in your position, I would kind of feel like I, I keep getting pushed back on, on, on it. Um, mm -hmm. Would you would you be okay if we could find another volunteer to pick this up? Sure, I'll be happy. Yep. Is there someone else in the call who's who's highly you know, who's who's highly organized? I am not. Um, who might be interested in picking this up? Well, okay, I've made enough noise about it. I probably should pitch in and do some work here. Awesome! Yay! Thanks, Mike. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, and Lucina volunteered as well, so I, I suggest that uh, both of you uh, could. Well, we don't need two. We, if, we don't need two. If Lucina wants to do it, that's fine with me. I think so, Lucina is uh, saying, yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with, I'm fine with either, either one of you, so. Uh, so I, I appreciate both of your willingness to help. Um, are, are you okay picking it up, Lucina? He says yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, and just to just to clarify, like we're we're very happy the uh, with the work that you that you did, Prem. So please please don't oh, no, feel bad. So, absolutely. But you you do you're you're doing so much for the team at this point, Prem. But it doesn't right. keep labeling things onto your onto your head. So right. work a little bit more. So sure, no issues. Yep. Sounds good. Okay, so um, final action item, um, uh, John to crisply express the invisible network and FIA problems uh, to, uh, to ML and or next week meetings and see network service mesh document. So. Oh, what are the things, Frederick, do you wanna share the agenda as you're walking through it? Oh, sure, uh, I can share it on, actually, I'm actually uh, talking on the phone, so if someone can share the agenda on chat on my behalf, that would be very useful. Cool. Would somebody be willing to volunteer? So, Frederick, uh, the agenda for today, right? So you yeah. want to? Okay. Yeah, Let just copy and paste to chat because it's. I'll do that. My, yeah, doing it on the phone is not. Uh, yeah. Sure. Oh, sorry guys, I think the formatting is going for a toss, so I hope it's okay, right? So for the, uh, for the invisible uh, uh, network uh, and uh, bio problems, is that something we want to talk now or do we want to, do we want to add it to, uh, to the uh, use case discussion or like, well, what do you, what do you want to do with that, John? Um, I had some comments online in the document and probably I think that's fine just now to have people look at it, make comments. <clears throat> I think um, Ivan from Intel made some really good comments and tried to, we tried to sort of narrow it down. I mean, the problem is, is in the data plane, you know, what, what do we want to expose in the data plane to Istio from NSM? I don't have a solution, but perhaps as we do the use cases, um, something may jump out at us. Any other thoughts? Okay, so, um...
my recommendation is uh, people who are interested in this uh, to read the document and comment on it. And what we can do is we can we can schedule some time in the next uh, um, or in one of the following weeks uh, once once you're ready to discuss this. If you feel that the topic is something we should discuss in the meeting, will uh, will that work? Okay, so uh, moving on. So we've um, had another week of uh, active uh, development. And uh, as you can see from uh, some of the uh, GitHub issues that we've, uh, that we've ran through, uh, the, the discussions that we've been Did we lose Frederick? Oh, you're on mute, Frederick. That's what happened. Least of CRDs wasn't working as expected, and so uh, that bug was uh, was squashed. Uh, there's also work that was done to re to refactor the. Uh, uh, some of the code and get it so that it's uh, reduce some of the code, some of the code duplication that we had and just ma make it a little bit more more robust and uh, there was some more work that was done around uh, handling um, handling errors so uh, so a lot so a lot of uh, as you would say ensuring that we don't accumulate too much. Uh, uh, technical technical debt in the process and uh, things that were uncovered through uh, through some additional testing uh, and for the uh, pull for pull requests that were uh, that were merged in as well uh, see it was I think that pretty much covered uh, the majority of things the, the only other thing was we've also we also updated uh, the kubernetes dependent uh, and uh, version and the client de dependencies to use the semantic versioning. Uh, so Kubernetes, for some reason, releases multiple versions, and some are semantic versions, and some of them are not. And depending which ones you pull in, you it def unfortunately def defaults to the non-semantic version. So just so just as a heads up, if if you want to know how to how to do semantic versioning Kubernetes properly, go look at our dependency files in, in this particular repo. So we've worked through those issues. Um, uh, I have a, sorry, I have a question sure. with regards to the dependency. Uh, with the 1.11, uh, there, is a, <clears throat> there was a change in the client go, and basically with the 1.11, the latest, like a beta 2, uh, client uh, version 7 doesn't work. So uh, you really have to do like a release uh, use branch release uh, 800 and I was kind of um, curious what's the plan because right now you're using the um, Kubernetes 110 so <clears throat> you guys planning to move to 111 at one point or what's the, um, what's the plan so th that's that's a good question um, at this point my my recommendation is until 111 is released that we not uh, that we that we because like the semantic versioning specifically, uh, I believe that they cut a release of client uh, client go after um, after one eleven would uh, would be released, and so it really it really depends on what the state of the system looks like at that particular point. You know, I, ideally, uh, is do you, do you know if the changes uh, like if there's any intention with with within the client go in order to Make it backwards compatible with 110 and 19 and so on. I okay. well, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, at least based on on the change uh, between the release seven and release eight. I mean, it seems that it's a kind of a breaking change. Uh, one of the reason why I looked into the uh, client eight is because with the 111 they introduce a new dynamic client. 
like uh, when you create a Kubernetes, uh, Kube, uh, Kubernetes client, you know, to talk to the API server, uh, you return um, Kubernetes interface and then a REST interface and then like b basically uh, three types of interfaces. And with the version eight, there is a dynamic client b that can be used to access pretty much any type of object. So, I mean, that's what, that's what, uh, I think it could simplify a little bit the code, uh, you know, when you deal with the client. So that's all. Okay, that, that makes sense. So, yeah, like, like right now their documentation and the documentation may be wrong and their compatibility matrix uh, claims that they will support Kubernetes 1, 9, 10, and 11 uh, in their head version and, uh, but yeah, I think we have to wait until um, um, and until they do their release and, and see if there's any to see if there's any issues. And I, I my gut feeling on this at this particular point is that it would probably be best if there's if it's incompatible, it would probably be best to just jump over the the um, to jump over that hoop now since we don't have any production uh, clients at this point as far as I as far as I know. Uh, if anyone is using production, please speak up. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go so far as to say is if you're using this in production, you're a braver man than I right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, so if so, my my suggestion would probably be to like let's let's move now and not um, and not wait. So that way that we're we're working on what will what our customers will more likely run on, and that likely will not be one ten uh, by the time that we cut a first release. Um, so does thank you for for bringing this up and we'll we'll spend uh, extra time to focus on this uh, on this issue to try to make a, a good uh, technical decision when more information is available great thanks so i i think we do we i think it sounds like we should take an ai to open an issue for this to make sure we track it and we can use that to discuss it right that's a fantastic idea so cool um, i mean go you just put a generic one down there and and one of us will get to it so Okay, so I've, that's added something on that. We'll get to it. Uh, yeah, th thank you for correcting that. I, I, that was bothering me as I typed it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, since we're done on, on that, the, uh, the last one was um, uh, network service mesh on uh, GKE. So if anyone wants to speak up on that. I think that was John's, I believe, right? Sorry, I was, I was on mute. So yeah, I did, I just, from the help from Kyle and Frederick, I just copied down the steps and kind of documented it. I wasn't quite quite, quite sure where to put it. So if anybody else is running GKE, there's a couple of little gotchas you to. This is, so John, this is, this is really cool. W would you mind basically creating a markdown file with this and we can check this sure. into the into the docs repository. Yeah, docs no directory. This, this would be super useful. Cool. Yeah. Exactly what I was thinking. Just, just give me an AI. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not a meeting until John has taken an AI. Yeah, and I Okay, so uh, let's move on to uh, use case mapping. So I will pass it on to uh, uh, which one of you three wants to make oh. it? Hey, uh, Frederick, uh, just one quick thing before we move to that. Sure. Um, I just wanted to bring up that uh, I would love to get some reviews on PR91 because that actually, there's, there, currently some of the stuff is broken due to that. So getting that one merged would be, would be great if anyone has a chance to take a look at that. Sure. I will hop on and uh, take, a, take a look at that after the, um, after the meeting. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, 
So use case mapping, I will pass it on to, uh, to Prem Fabian and John McDowell. So uh, use case document is on the, the link is on the agenda. So, so let me also share it, share it on the uh, chat. So that and, and just a heads up, the use case document is also available on, the, uh, the link is also available on the, uh, uh, GitHub. On the Git, GitHub repo. So if, so if you can't see the chat or, or so on, feel free to go to the GitHub repo. And you can Sorry. It there. Yeah. Um, I don't think it'll, so whoever had a problem with accessing Google Docs, I don't think that it'll help for you to take, to go through that path because that's also a Google Doc. So uh, sorry about that. Anyways, it's added to you, Prem. Sure. Um, so quick update on the use case document. Uh, there are a bunch of comments and then uh, I've incorporated the comments for the use cases related to that of the uh, uh, cloud networking. Um, I have also added uh, uh, the distributed uh, uh, mesh or incorporated that on just to reflect on how the use case looks with respect to the uh, uh, distributed bridge model. Um, I just want to uh, briefly cover about that and then probably pass it on to uh, John to share his updates. Um, so um, this is in continuation to the uh, presentation that Ed uh, touched upon last time. Um, so uh, the idea is basically use the uh, route rules. Uh, Are you yeah. sharing on the Zoom what you're talking to? Oh, sorry. I thought... Uh, uh, could one of you share because my uh, connection is a bit flaky. Um, I can absolutely share. It just thanks a lot. I, do, I find it easier to follow these things when the pictures in front of me. So it's giving sure. one. Yeah. Second, I'll get it up there. Yeah. So, and then you'll have uh, to make sure you stay on the right part of the document. Sure, I'll, I'll mention that. And uh, cool. So, uh, is this? So let me give you the page number so that uh, page number is good. Okay. Well, it's going to be page nine. nine. Page nine. Well, there are no page numbers on the document, so I'm not sure. Um, so, uh, further so down. Further down, okay. Uh, oh, sorry, I think you just passed. Yeah, here, 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 the same. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, um, so um, the use case uh, basically talks about uh, the how do we build a uh, distributed uh, or using distributed uh, bridge, how do you build the same use case? Uh, here, uh, that can be two types of uh, um, two types of meshes. One is the persistent full mesh. What is meant by persistent is um, as a as a prerequisite of the uh, of this particular use case, you do need uh, VXLANs uh, uh, between all the uh, compute nodes. Um, so the only downside to this particular approach is that uh, when the, the number of compute nodes increases. Uh, it's going to uh, increase the um, number of mesh between this because of the uh, numbers involved. Um, so the idea that is basically mentioned here is that how about an on-demand full mesh? Uh, the idea of on-demand full mesh is that, uh, let's assume that we'll pl uh, play with the use case. Uh, let's assume that uh, uh, the one of the uh, um, application exposes a L2 channel and um, the others would essentially want to connect with that. Uh, so in this case, what happens is the information is available in the service discovery and any other client uh, or the part that wants to have this request, when they request, the VXLANs are uh, connected on demand. Um, and uh, this is going to happen for the first request uh, for such any uh, such uh, uh, channel. And then uh, it will continue on um, uh, for uh, the defined the, for the defined teardown policy. Um, by this, what happens is uh, you avoid the uh, full mesh uh, uh, problem that you have in case of the uh, uh, persistent full mesh. Um, so these two use cases would probably uh, fit in well uh, in case of uh, our network service mesh. And the recommendation would be based on how you want to have uh, your mesh created. Um, so that's what I've captured here. And then the diagram again explains the uh, interaction between the uh, various components. Here you have the bridge part, uh, which essentially exposes channel, and then a part, a subsequent part would uh, that wants to have a connection would essentially request for the connection, and then it uh, continues on in the life cycle. 
Um, so this is the update I, uh, I've added uh, in addition to that of the uh, uh, conventional model. Um, I've also incorporated the other comments from um, uh, people who have uh, given until now. Uh, thanks for the comments. Um, also, I think uh, I just uh, touched upon the cap app uh, use case. I just saw the cap app use case. Uh, I think this seems to be similar to that of uh, the BGP VPN use case. Uh, probably um, when we touch, when we discuss uh, uh, the cap app use case, we can probably further discuss on uh, whether we want to have some collaboration between both the use cases. Um, that's all I had from the update point of view. Probably I'll pass it on to John if he has any updates. John? I, I, yeah, I don't have any updates. The only thing I was doodling with this week is trying to tease out some design patterns from the all the various use cases to try and categorize them. I'm not sure if this is really useful, but it's just, it just made the way my mind works to try and look for yeah, I'll, I'll, patterns. I'll speak up with somebody whose mind works also that way. Um, I would find it super useful because I tend to finish very rapidly up and down the abstraction uh, tree. And so you know, I do tend to sort of look a lot of, at a lot of concrete things and try and, and squeeze out what the common patterns are. So it would be really super helpful for me. I don't know how everybody else's brain works. Uh, plus one to that, I will also be interested, John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Frederick, give me another action item. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the AI master. master. <laughs> the AI master. We do appreciate all that you do, John. Very much. Yes. Yeah. And we love working with you, John. <laughs> Thank you, Prem. <laughs> cool. So one other, uh, uh, just to add to that, John, uh, I've always been doing a lot of work around uh, microservice patterns aligning. So that is also one of the favorite areas. So yeah. So let me take my doodles and put them in a put them in the document, and then people can comment on them. I I I mean, what I have so far, it it doesn't feel quite right. But I think maybe having other people make suggestions might, will probably be the better way to get to get it done. So getting different viewpoints. Excellent. Always good. So, Prem, back to you. Uh, yes, so I think uh, I'm sorry, I missed the person who, was, who had added the cap up use case, probably. That was, um, oh, was me, basically. Oh, hey. hey, nice meeting you. So, do you want to present the uh, cap up uh, use case? Do you want to share? Um, I'm more than happy to have you share so you can drive. If yeah, that's it's totally fine. Uh, it uh, would be great to, to have a chat. So, we need to, tend, need to change that. Yeah, well, basically. Uh, it was uh, just a quick hack to bring the information in here. Uh, uh, 10 yeah, times. So let, me, let me go ahead and let you share so you can drive. That ends up working better when it, when it works. Okay, hang on a second, please. Uh, okay, you can see it. So while we're, so yep. while we're setting That's... that up, um, I need a name for that action item that we just discussed. The patterns. Was this the one for John? For John? Yeah, for John. Okay. <laughs> All the action items are belonging to John. I'm happy with that. <laughs> I have to go to the event in Alias so I can join these meetings. <laughs> okay. Sorry, John. I'm actually I'm out of uh, uh, I'm traveling, so I'll probably help you join you uh, soon, and then work with you on the other AIs. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. All right, I got a new GitHub script to uh, reassign everything to John. <laughs> cool, okay, sorry, um, let's <laughs> continue on. <laughs> okay, I'm done with that. So maybe you can quickly talk about the use case uh, we quickly added before the call. Um, yeah, basically, uh, as already mentioned by Prem, it's uh, mostly a bridge or a layer two use case. Uh, what we have here, which is um, up, uh, at the moment in time, absolutely not related to uh, network service mesh from, from an implementation perspective, but from a, a, the use case perspective. 
the thing what we need to do here is obviously to transport um, uh, cup wap encapsulated frames with coming from the fields basically outside the Kubernetes cluster to a cup up controller. Um, Cupwap is basically a UDP encapsulated protocol for the control plane and user plane. I think the guys in the call probably know, or need we, do we need to go into it a bit? I, I'm not too uh, familiar with Cupwap, but... Yeah, it, it would be good if you could probably share okay, yeah. make it. Make a quick what it is, basically. It's a, it's a Wi-Fi uh, control protocol for uh, wireless access points, which is uh, um, standardized in, uh, in IDF. And basically, as, as anywhere, you have a, a cup up control protocol, which tells the yellow box, which is a WTP, a wireless termination point, to uh, bring, up, uh, bring up a Wi-Fi network so that the uh, user equipment, the UA can, can attach to and all the control home elements for authentication, authorization, and uh, uh, channel management, etc., are going to the CAPFAP C channel. It's a classic control plane. And the user plane is uh, encapsulated in CAPFAP U, which is uh, a quite uh, usual uh, tunnel protocol, which has a tunnel ID, uh, uh, which relates to the control plane. Etc. So, and, and both uh, uh, both protocols needs to be terminated uh, in a Kubernetes cluster, which already creates some usual problem because it's UDP and you need. I think we just lost your audio. Well, I'm mute. Ed. I, I hear you now. You were saying they create some problems because it's UDP, and then you broke up at least for me. Ah, okay. Uh, bringing UDP uh, uh, traffic into the... Apparently, the world does not want you to express what it is about UDP, because you said bringing the UDP traffic into the... And then, then I lost you. Is, it, <laughs> is anybody else losing his audio? Or is it just me? No, uh, I also too. lost the... I lost... Okay, sorry about this. I'm... Well, I tell you what, we... I think we go away with the camera. It works. Somehow. Yeah, it helps. So, can you hear me now? I hear you fine now. Okay. So, basically, the problem is uh, quite often in the cloud to bring UDP uh, traffic into a cluster to a pod. Uh, um, because of uh, layer four load balancers, etc., sometimes time timeout issues on UDP. But besides the fact this can be managed, uh, 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 we have done it in a bare metal deployment with some uh, special um, load balancer configuration. At one day, uh, the UDP traffic uh, reaches uh, the, the cup up uh, port basically where the control plane and data plane uh, is running as a container. And uh, this is represented by the CP and DP box here. And this CP and DP uh, uh, talks to each other over normal cube network over CNI to, to share information. So it's basically an internal, internal message protocol. So now we're referring to the layer two, because now the, 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 the data pass decapsulates uh, the CAPWAP U traffic, and after decapsulation, you have basically the traffic or the layer two frames of the device, which are from the MAC addressing perspective foreign to the Kubernetes network, so basically uh, it wouldn't be forwarded at all. So that means if we want to give this traffic to another network function, in this case, the, the uh, CGW, IPsec, and GRE, that's called, uh, in our terms, connectivity so this, gateway. This is a really good use case, because you've got a classic illustration there of what we mean when we say that your payload is L2. Yeah, exactly. Right, so it's a beautiful use case. Yeah, that's a problem, yeah, your payload is L2, you put an L2 payload, into the cloud and you'll die because all security settings uh, will not allow to have 
remote payload from foreign mechanisms. Any number of crazy things could go wrong, absolutely. So, for nearly everything, from make learning tables, it's it. it, it, it. <laughs> okay, all, almost everything goes wrong. I'll buy that. I'll buy that. <laughs> I think, oh, no, we I think you lost, I lost them again. Yeah, we lost your audio again, which is really sad because I'm excited about this use case. <laughs> Can you hear me now? It's better. I hear you now. Okay, cool. So, yeah, sorry about that. Next time we make it better. Anyway, uh, what we have done then is say, uh, okay, uh, as we have dynamic pods, there are no, no stable endpoints, etc. So we, we have started to label, to label the pods with a simple label that's called a VXLAN truth. And there's a, another controller watching for the labels and uh, have some annotations. And then um, uh, the controller XX into the pod, which is a little bit hacky, and spans a dynamic VXLAN between two pods. That's basically represented by the VXLAN 2DP, VXLAN 2TP, which is a which is a pod or a sidecar in the container, which creates a VXLAN link uh, and pushes in the interfaces into the pod. So from the use case perspective, uh, uh, different naming, but exactly what you're proposing was, uh, was netmatch, but uh, done differently homegrown. So from, from there, we, we the, the, the layer two traffic uh, uh, or payload traverses via the VXLAN to the next pod, which then creates an IPsec GRE uh, uh, tunnel, which uh, is terminated externally in the service controller uh, box and uh, uh, this way we're leaving the cluster basically because we need to hand over to a foreign system here. So basically what we have in the use case is a inner Kubernetes cluster L2 payload which needs to be distributed uh, 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 or, or linked across pods and then we need to leave uh, uh, the cluster and uh, forward the traffic through a GRE tunnel to, to a remote system. And to achieve that, uh, uh, that's basically in production at the moment for a couple of months or even a year now, um, but has no mention to go in this, in this way, in this implementation upstream. It's just to demonstrate the use case. Um, 10 minutes before the call, we, uh, with the help of Anton, he also, he also joins the call here. Um, we pushed the VXLAN controller uh, uh, public to the, to the open CNF group, which we are, uh, have created on GitHub, just um, to, to look at this, uh, uh, how it be done. Um, yeah, basically that's, that's the use case. And, and uh, if there are any questions or about the implementation, I think Anton, you are here, you are happy to, to answer this as well. And if about the use case, I can also answer. I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so you're saying that your controller uh, builds the VXLAN tunnel between the ports. So basically, uh, they are leveraging the same, uh, the interfaces which are provided by the CNI, right? You just build on top like the TCP tunnel between the two ports, right? Exactly, it has nothing to do with CNI. CNI is not uh, involved here at all. And uh, basically the controller accepts in and makes some commands to create an interface with a given name, which comes from the manifest uh, uh, in the port. Oh, so your port then has multiple interfaces, like one, the regular CNI, and then another, the new one, uh, VXLAN. Exactly. If you, Interesting. If you look on the EDP interface, which is uh, Erlang distribution protocol, what we use internally, this goes via the CNI interface, but the payload, it's uh, totally separated over this VXLAN interface. So, maybe, uh, if we want, we can go into the manifest here to show how it looked like. So this is actually very good. And you're right, this is very much up the alley of the kinds of th thoughts we're thinking here in Network Service Mesh. Um, because effectively what you've done is you, you've come up with a way to sort of hack standing up what we call a connection for L2 payloads between mm -hmm. 
your, your CapWap uh, TS and your CGW IPsec GRE, and then likewise to stand up a connection you know, of type IPsec to your external service con uh, controller, if I'm understanding correctly. Exactly. We have two different implementation of a link, let's say. One goes external, one is internal, one is VXLAN based, the other one is IPsec GRE based. Yep. So that's and I, I, I presume the VXLAN is carrying an L2 payload and the IPsec uh, link is carrying an L3 payload. Uh, in this case, uh, the IPsec link is carrying the GRE payload, which then carries uh, uh, still the L2 payload because L2 has that's to go fair. to the con control. That's fair. I, 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 so I'm amused to note that I will add that to my, my very long list of ways that people carry L2 payloads because GRE <laughs> uh, was not on the list yet, but it should be. Yeah. It's, it's still the case. So uh, especially in this use case, yeah. So um, the other use cases we have in mind, we have a quite similar one with just carrying GTP, so generic tunneling protocol payloads, and and uh, bringing up ports, implementing an uh, uh, NGGSN and, and mobile core. And if it fails, it comes up on a different port and gets a VLAX land dynamic controller to to uh, come up with the same endpoint IP address and, and stuff like this. But these are different use cases. I, we try to put in the L2 use case, but because as you say, everything will break with L2 payload in a, in a cluster. So it's... Uh, uh, this, is, this is good stuff. And, and, and the, the everything, it's even worse than the everything breaks as an L2 payload in the cluster in that, and I've, I've occasionally had this conversation with people, uh, Kubernetes actually makes no, has no concept of an L2 segment. So if you try and stick a Mac, you know, an L2 frame out there, God only knows what would happen, right? Even if nothing broke, it certainly has no guarantee of getting where it's supposed to go. Exactly. As seen in nearly all virtualization environments, uh, there's nothing Kubernetes related. Uh, we have deployed the same thing in OpenStack, uh, uh, on a, uh, not in containers, not in ports, etc. So, uh, and even in VMware, if you are not careful and you put layer two payloads in there, it either doesn't work, breaks things, or uh, you need to have special security settings, and it's all all a mess. Uh, that, that, that's, that's totally fair. Now, this is very cool. I appreciate you bringing this to us. Um, so are, are, what are your foregoing interests here? It sounds like you're interested in sort of, um, you know, looking at, making sure, number one, that we can meet your use case with network service mesh. Um, overall, are you interested in the medium to long term with, in terms of using network service mesh? Yeah, it's basically exactly that because uh, network service mesh from this perspective is not not, not really our use case, uh, so, but we want to leverage uh, uh, the cloud native uh, environment, uh, Kubernetes as it, as it is. Uh, we have a strong opinion that network service mesh, as you call it, you guys call it, uh, has exactly similar functionalities from a pattern perspective than the classic service mesh, let's say the, the, the TCP and HTTP ones, but, uh, 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 but for L2 and L3 uh, payloads. So, the so medium term goals would be to to uh, join to join network service mesh here and one day phase out the VLAX land controller the homegrown stuff to to go there we are also in a project currently which is a running which is a plug fest about this stuff where, where we are in a research project so we could, could we would like to promote to start to bring up this lab environment uh, with service mesh because numbers of L2, L3 peer payload uh, CNFs will come up in this lab, and that's uh, why we are. Yeah, that, that's, like that's, that's hugely exciting. Uh, frankly, on all fronts, um, we're delighted to have you guys involved. Um, you know, and, and and just don't be at all shy about asking anything uh, that might help you move that forward. We would love to see you guys move us into the flood fest space there. Yeah, sure. That's uh, you, you really don't try to be shy. It's just about timing something. Times and uh, <laughs> getting out from the console, but I, uh, the, the the interesting part for us would be uh, to learn how your activity, your working group, uh, is received in the SIG networking. Is it something which is besides beside of that, or have it a chance to get, let's call it upstream, or get uh, get forward here, or uh, where we where you stand at the moment uh, uh, with. Was yeah, uh, I, 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 could, I could tell you my viewpoint, and I would actually encourage others on the call to express theirs. We did present, I think, two weeks ago, roughly, to the, the to SIG networking, um, 
And I, I think we got overall a pretty positive reception there um, from folks. The, the, one of the benefits of the network service mesh approach is that we don't actually need any changes in Kubernetes proper, um, which is really helpful to us because we don't have to go try and convince like three, four, five different groups in Kubernetes to change something for us. But it's also seen as a good thing by uh, SIG networking. I know Tim made a comment that he really liked that about this particular approach. Um, you know, since then, we, we've actually been starting up conversations and trying to have a conversation with the SIG networking group about whether it makes more sense for network service mesh to be a sub project of SIG networking or a Kubernetes working group or sort of what's the right formal structure there. Um, we were going to have that conversation yesterday at the SIG networking meeting, but the turnout at SIG networking was very, very low this, this past meeting. Um, and so we, we didn't get to have quite that conversation, but we're, we're actively working to line up with SIG networking. And so far they seem pretty warm to us. Does, does anyone yeah, I else they want to add? I can give you my experience for that. Uh, 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 there was, if you go back to mailing list and SIG networking, there was three attempts, uh, and even in the channel on Slack, to say, hey, SFC, service function chaining, and service mesh is basically the same. Yeah, why not uh, thinking in this direction? And um, But this as was mostly up in the bones, and, 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 and nobody was following this due to the HTTP, HTTP folks usually are there, and uh, so uh, networking is not highly represented in, in, in this group, in my experience. Yeah. Well, that, 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 that's, that's fine. I mean, the, the thing is that the, the SIG networking guys have solved a very important class of problem really well. Um, yeah. it just like the Istio and the Envoy guys have solved a very important class of problem very well. And, and even though I'm hugely in favor of sort of borrowing by analogy the, the good things they've done, I don't think trying to ram L2 and L3 payloads into their already functioning really well for them system is exactly. likely to be a happy experience for anyone. Yeah, yeah. To, to further that, uh, the Kubernetes use cases are primarily around enterprise, which primarily calls for uh, a very specific uh, L3, L4 pattern. And so like, I know it sounds a little bit negative, but it's actually the, was, was the right approach for, for Kubernetes in order to keep it simple and to grow. Uh, you know, it just, it affects us by saying not having anything like L2 or so on. So like, this is an attempt to lift those, but uh, lift those use cases. Uh, but yeah, from a Kubernetes perspective, like if you, if you go up to them and you ask them for a feature, uh, if that feature has wide enterprise, uh, uh, use cases, then there's a good chance it'll get in. But if it's, if it doesn't, uh, or it complicates those use cases, then the chances of getting it in, I mean, it's still not impossible, but it, it's, it, it'll be significantly more, more difficult because like telco and so on is not, is not the main, the main use case. But, uh, I think that we'll gain, as we gain more traction, uh, we have the capability to, to add into some of that, some of that influence around areas where Kubernetes use may not be as strong. So I, I would second everything. My, my perception matches yours, Frederick, with one exception, which is I think it's the perception of broad enterprise use cases. Um, I think in, at, at various points, there are things enterprises will discover they need that may not be perceived as being a need yet. And I hope, hope we can help with some of those. Oh, yeah. absolutely. You know, the container startup is, is, an excellent, is an excellent example. So, uh, or pod startup, I should, I should say, rather than yeah. container startup um, for like how long it takes. But um, yeah, so yeah, I, um, sorry, go on. No, sorry, go on, Frederick. I, I'll just add it up to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think like, from my from my view as well, like this particular approach, like we we went with the term service mesh because it makes it easy for people to to latch onto. But the goal was not to stop to stop there, but to build something that was a lot more flexible. So use cases like yours can can be built. So this is like totally in scope. So don't feel like you're diverting us or anything like that by bringing up these type of use cases. Like this is actually a really, really great example of, of mm. something that I believe that you'd like to support. Okay, which leads to the next question. I said we starting next week was bring up a, a, plug, a plug fest environment here, which is run for about two years and adding more and more features uh, in the future. Uh, Given this use case we we shown here, how ready for prime is NSM 
at the moment? When you think we should start to make the hands dirty and what you expect from a, from a steep or, or flat learning curve here for people that already have done it? Does it make sense to mess around with that already from an implementation perspective to work with that? Or should we wait a little bit more? Uh, which just goes basically back to Anton on the call because he has written the VXLAN controller for, from our side. Is this already there or is this an experiment or how, what's the status of NSM? Well, we're still very, we're still very new. Like in, in fact, just from a timeline perspective, um, mm -hmm. uh, the first conversation that Ed and I had about this was in uh, mid to late March. And so all the work that you've seen from then to now is literally been between the past, literally the past 70 days. Mm -hmm. And so uh, from a, from the implementation side, uh, we're, you know, we, we already have, we're, we're building up the primitives at this particular point in order to, um, in, in order to describe this. So like we've added in Kubernetes CRDs and we're adding, we've built up a protocol buffer APIs, uh, which those would actually be really good for you to review uh, as well. Uh, just so you can get a sense as to like what, like, like what the core functionality is that we're that we're working with, um, and uh, so, but yeah, but we there's still there's still some more work that needs to be done before I would be comfortable saying that yeah this is ready ready for a prime time. Yeah, so, so, so. Two, th two things come to mind for me. Like number one is you know obviously you guys need IP sick over GRE and people with real concrete needs at hand who want to try things tend to bump up the priority of things. As I mentioned, IPsec over Jiri was not on my list before. It is definitely now. Um, the other one that, that I actually wanted to throw out there is we would really welcome your participation in the development community. You sort of have an opportunity here to, to shape making sure that um, we meet the kinds of needs that you see and that you see from other folks um, by participation in the community. And I, I can tell you, having often arrived at communities after, the, the, um, after things have hardened, after you know, stuff is already in deployment, it's really nice to have that opportunity for early influence. And so we'd welcome your participation. Um, and then also you guys look like essentially prime beta customers for us um, in terms of you've got a use case, um, you know, when NSM does actually get to a point you can try it out, you guys kicking the tires would be extremely valuable to us. So be before we continue on, uh, let me just wrap up the meeting and we can continue the discussions afterwards if you're both, uh... Uh, if you're both interested. So um, first, uh, thank you everyone for, for attending. Uh, is, is there any last minute stuff that we, that we didn't get to that we should add to the, uh, to the agenda for, uh, for next week? I think meeting time planning was, the, was really the only one. Okay, so anyways, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick around for this conversation. So if, if uh, I don't know if Ed has time, historically he's had to drop off. Um, I, I actually do have time on this occasion, and I'm delighted that I do. So so I'm I'm willing to stick around for more conversation as well. So let's uh, let's say this concludes the uh, the meeting, and then we'll we'll continue this particular conversation. Uh, um, I, I will take this opportunity to remind folks that the. Meeting is recorded in its entirety from the very beginning, and that'll include this after meeting conversation. I don't think that's a problem. I think in many ways it's a good thing, but it, it's always nice to make sure people are aware. That's right. Um, should I add that to the preamble? Uh, I'll, I'll create a, a preamble <laughs> to say at the start of every meeting, and, that, and it'll include that. <clears throat> we, we, the people of, of the, the cloud native networking world, in order to form a more perfect match. Um, <laughs> Hey, they, they actually, um, in, when, when you talk in uh, ham radio uh, nets, uh, many of them actually have set preambles that they say at the beginning of every, of every start. Uh, first, asking if there's any emergencies, and then two, describing what, what it is that they're there for. They say it every time. Cool. So anyways, um, I'm diverging, so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I, so so I was just saying before, like I think these type of use cases, you know, like we we talk about network service mesh, and we've given some some examples, but you know, like the examples that we've given are like by no means like saying this is in concrete, like 
the rails that we're that we're setting. So we we want to make something that is ideally my 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 viewpoint on it is that we want to make something that is uh, that's flexible to handle these type of use cases. And if you can if you can think of it and it aligns with uh, the patterns that of, of the primitives that we've provided, then there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to to do it, barring a barring some technical technical reason. Like if you say we want to send L2 over some environment that doesn't support it, and of course not, you know. But ideally, you know, we want to have uh, we we want to have the SDN and the services and clients all work out and essentially negotiate uh, the transports so that the, so that you can build whatever it is you want to you want to build in this particular like like this particular use case and uh, and get things working. So so we definitely definitely appreciate this particular this particular use case. Yeah, sure. That's 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 understood. And thanks for well receiving that. For 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 us, it's basically the question when and let's say how to join uh, the, the the activities here. So therefore, the the answer is that uh, Tim and the guys have this well received. So which was more or less, uh, uh, I think, easy because it doesn't affect uh, the the CNI, the underlying background, etc. So, uh, and as I said, we, we are starting not in production. We are not intended to say, hey, please make uh, NSM stable next week because we need to migrate the production servers uh, uh, over next week. That's not the point here. But as I said, next week, we're starting with, uh, with uh, a group of developers, even students and junior developers, which can dive in whatever we decide. And if, uh, NSM uh, a good fit, then they can dive in there and using this uh, uh, framework, this technology to solve the use cases here. That's where the, the, the question was coming from, where, where and when we, we should go. If we would be in a situation where a bring up of a system every second breaks and it's very, very early, et cetera, et cetera, and only to understand from one lead developers, et cetera, then maybe it would be not the right moment to do to go in here. But if, if the environment is already in a, in a shape where I say, okay, we can start with that and adapting uh, and helping for the use cases and bring back uh, uh, issues, problems, et cetera, uh, and, and, and ideas we see, uh, then um, I think, we, we are happy to join uh, rather sooner than later. And maybe you should know we also are uh, part of the VPP community. So we, we know the underlying data pass elements quite well, working with them already for the VNF itself. And therefore having a network service mesh, which is based on the same, uh, uh, same uh, yeah. data pass would be a premium as well because otherwise you you end up in too many tools so uh, quite honestly so nsm itself is agnostic as to the data plane that you choose so they're they're as you choose to use mm -hmm. um in general, there's sort of the there's the data plane inside your your cnf your cloud native network function and, mm -hmm. and obviously we're agnostic as to that that's whatever you're going to do um nsm is also agnostic as to what you might call sort of the underlay data plane in other words the thing that is connecting the connections that said mm -hmm. um as you might imagine, there are quite a few people in the NSM community who care a lot about VPP, and so I expect that to be one of the early data planes supported. Um, so you're, you're going to get basically what you're looking for. Um, I, have a, I have a question just out of my own curiosity, um, and, and this is because often, so you're dealing with wireless traffic right now, um, and one of the interesting things that, that we've gotten from some other folks is what I would call the exotic L2s. Sorry. So, for example, if you exotic L2 protocols. So, for example, um, in talking to the cable guys, um, they have use cases where they would like to be able to pass DOCSIS frames as the L2 payload. Exactly. Um, do you have exotic L2s like that in the wireless space that it might be interesting to pass um, over an, an L2, you know, over a connection and network service mesh? I think from a from an outer frame perspective. Uh, it starts with classic Ethernet L2 when the traffic arrives us. Yeah? Uh, so because okay. I think DOCSIS, 
goes behind that. Uh, um, maybe on wireless framing as well. If you if you look at uh, eight to eleven frames, yeah, it's of course it's a bit more. But from what we need to carry, I don't see it for the current use cases we we have uh, in, in production. Uh, so well, that's okay. classic. That's completely mm -hmm. fine. Just tuck in the back of your mind that one of the design intents here is to be able to support exotic L2, L2 and L3 protocols if need be, because there are a bunch of them around. And if you just leave the architectural white space for them, supporting them is super easy. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and if you don't, then you make it very hard for people. Like I've got similar things talking to fiber channel guys where you know they're, they've got their own L2 and L3. And, and if your attitude is, there are kinds of L2 and L3 payloads, then it's a very easy game to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I say, it, uh, what do you mean with exotic? You mean from a, from a framing perspective going behind the Ethernet L2 frame or from the payload itself or, or from as of? You're gone now, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. When I say exotic, I mean non-Ethernet, because there's a very large percentage of the world that thinks there exists one and only one L2 protocol, and that yeah. protocol yeah. is Ethernet. Um, radar here, as we go into, into the mobile core network elements, there mm -hmm. is upcoming uh, non-IP transport for, for vendor data in the uh, narrowband IoT. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is, which is a 128 byte sensor frame, which is encapsulated somehow, and then will arrive somehow, and you need to forward it somehow. That's yep. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You, you, you yeah. see precisely my point, and, and that's, that's entirely why we're trying to keep it, because it's cheap to keep it generic if you think to, but a whole lot of people think Ethernet is the only L2 there is. Yeah, but it isn't, yeah. So. Yeah, that's uh, at, at least from the IoT perspective. Yes, we are in this in this uh, area, area, and as you say, maybe Doxus is coming around. There's no current customer need at the moment, but our customer base, which are carriers, are usually also in this in, in, in this area, but not direct at the moment. Cool. What I also think, uh, just swapping out ideas here, what we have discussed in, 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 in our offices, uh, uh, that with network service mesh or with the principles of network service mesh, which is basically encapsulating any kind of traffic in, in an encapsulation that called VXLAN and bring it to the next part, could be also a transport primitive for classic service mesh. Because usually what you do with a classic service mesh is very expensive. Yeah? What you do is you, you need to pass protocols and you need to put in uh, HTTP X headers and then you create a new packet and then you send it forward. Yeah? Why not doing it the other way around, encapsula uh, encapsulate the traffic, yeah? put an NSH header around that yeah? and, and no need for, for even uh, 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 decoding the packet and encoding the packet again because you have this, uh, you have this trace IDs or whatever IDs on the outer frame. This way, you even could transport TLS frames or whatever you you you, you, you want. Should, you, should, you you should absolutely talk to John McDowell. He's actively trying to write th down things in that direction. I think he was the guy who got all the action items on the call. Um, <laughs> so. That's an action so, item. So, so add another action item for him. <laughs> um, can't even leave the call without getting action item. But exactly, that's that are the ideas uh, how to how to uh, make this happen, or even put trace IDs for open tracing in there. Somehow arguable in, in user plane if it goes to high speed. However, uh, if not going to high speed for whatever tracing scenario, you you can. You can do it as well. Yeah. Actually, there are good things for that. This 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 might be a, a an interesting use case as well, where perhaps uh, if you have something that doesn't support those tracings, but you want to to add them in, and that's all that you're going to look for, except when maybe you get a new uh, a new flow, you have to initiate a new a new ID. But uh, there might be an interesting use case to to show as a. Uh, uh, to to add in a, a example where perhaps you encapsulate an encapsulation 
uh, and add in these particular headers and then transfer as you uh, and make your decisions as, as you would and then de-encapsulate yeah. on the on the other end and so yeah. uh, you know I, it, it, it's it should be you know and it, sh it should be tr trivial to do this in um uh, in our in the architecture that we're that we're proposing, but at the same time, uh, be able to, yeah, you know, and you know, basically, I, I think it'd be a really great way because to to also demonstrate uh, some of the flexibility because we're showing here's something that that it's an L2 frame that no one else in the world has ever seen, but here it is handling it without any without any issues. Yeah, does, does that make sense? Yeah, that that, that totally makes sense and. And the thing is, we, we've got some really fascinating tools for that as well, um, because not only can we do sort of a, an, a, you know, so a thing that essentially encapsulates you in a way that you get tracing, but we've, we've already got built into things like VPP, stuff like the IOAM uh, protocol from the IETF, where we can not only trace what's happening sort of above the, the, the tunnel, but we can actually trace where the tunnel is going. Because you know, to the degree that you have IOAM support, which is starting to come online in your networking devices, you will get per hop information, including latency information for where the tr tunnel transited to. So the amount of tracing you could inject via in network service mesh becomes frankly, insanely huge. It's really cool. Exactly, and then you put it on the normal own tracing API and push it away, but, but, but you have at least the metadata in your hands based on the IOM stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, absolutely. Well, absolutely. Yeah, just just remember when we do that, we have to define the APIs in a way that other SDNs can eventually implement such functionality. <laughs> oh no, absolutely. I, I I that I totally get in. You know, for example, if you were going to do tracing, you would probably want to negotiate tracing the same way that you yeah. negotiate modeling, um, so that you know basically you're actually doing tracing in a way that both sides can deal with. Um, but this actually brings up a new matter, which is we've talked about the negotiation of tunneling. And it's all, all fine and dandy to wave your hands at being able to do something similar for tracing. But as we're building out the, the, the RPC between NSMs, we probably do want to be able to express a, a preference on tracing. And I think tracing is a little orthogonal to underlying in cap. Um, sure. Yeah. So, but but that actually, in cap is at least uh, a distributed or a correlated trace ID, yeah, that's, that's what you need, yeah? so, so at least you need to bring... Well, both, things need to support, both things need to support the tracing, mm -hmm. um, whatever the tracing mechanism is, and then there is an exchange of, of the correlators. And right now, the way the negotiation between two NSMs is mostly shaking out is the requesting NSM says, I can do this. The, you know, the NSM on the far side basically comes back and says, okay, well, of the things you suggested to me in preference order, this is the one I picked you know, because mm. of my preferences. And here are the parameters related to it. And for the tracing, it would be your, your trace IDs, right? Yes. Um, and so effectively, the, the requestee is in charge of the parameters um, in these situations, because it's the one who ultimately has to make the decision. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, so that would be to keep to one round trip. Yeah, one of the other uh, use, use cases that we're gonna have to think a little bit about as well is, uh, it's. It, I, I can see potential use cases where you might have one NSM that's man that's being that's managing, let's say VPP, and then see another one manages ODL, and you want to do tracing across the both of them, uh, as an example. And it's like, what would what would that use case like? Is that even something we want to do in the first place? You yeah, I, I I would say that that something that looks like that is very likely. Um, you know, because you know. In, 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 and again, in that scenario, whatever the NSM that's, that's controlling or talking to ODL, it, it would basically have to um, have some set of things it's capable of. And you know, so if the NSM on the pod is using VPP, it can do IOM, and it comes across and it says, okay, I'd like to trace with IOM as part of this connection. And the, um, the far end comes back and says, well, that's nice. I've never heard of this IOM thing. That needs to fail gracefully. Um, and my suspicion is failing gracefully means you just don't get tracing, but you do get in cap. Yeah, and, I'm, and I, I think something that we may end up being able to do is um, if we, if someone were to use, um, I'm, I'll use a higher, a higher level example. Like suppose that we were to define uh, a protocol buffer that describes tracing, uh, that could be encapsulated into a uh, into a network service mesh connection 
that then handles the uh, that they can then traverse across all all NSMs, and so that so there may be uh, interesting ways that we can utilize our own architecture to smooth over the differences between different uh, different SDNs uh, and still get the same uh, the same functionality, and so. Uh, yeah, we we have options, you know. Yeah, no, this is this is very exciting. May, so, may I come up? Uh, we have some time because uh, leaving the tracing area a little bit. We have another use case which is a little bit pressing. Uh, I, I I like to address or like to discuss basically, which is uh -huh. which is uh, about well, let's call it dependency across the paths. Yeah, uh, uh, let's say you have microservices which do different things. The right hand side is establishing an IPsec or whatever routing pass to the connection to a remote end. And on the left hand side, you have your cup up termination or GDP termination. So yep. basically, if the right hand side is loses the connection, then the left hand side is not allowed to, to uh, receive traffic anymore because otherwise you're stuck. Yeah? Because it's a more or less disconnected microservice-based uh, environment. Yeah, you need somehow tell the left hand, the left hand uh, uh, VNF that they should shut down or not accept any traffic anymore because the next uh, one, the path is broken somehow. Yeah, so uh, which means. Yeah, I, 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 I think Frederick has thought a little bit about this already. I, I, my suggestion would be that you inform the left hand v CNF. That you can no that you can no longer service this connection in some manner. Maybe it's a disconnect of the connection, but or whatever. But you can't service it anymore. And then it's up to the uh, left hand C CNF to decide what the right response to that is. Right. In fact, um, we, we can uh, we can borrow a lot from uh, from enterprise use cases in this scenario because they have that uh, that same path in many in many scenarios. So I'll give an example from uh, from Netflix. Someone watches wants to watch a, a video and suppose that uh, they have a failure that prevents them from being able to service customers in a given region or uh, or maybe watch a specific set of videos rather than allow the customer to continue on and press play and then buffer and wait for it to never arrive and upset the customer. Uh, it's, they wanted to return an error fast. And so there's a number of techniques. Uh, the one that comes to mind is, that would probably be most helpful is uh, probably what they call circuit breaking. Uh, but there's, there's numerous techniques that we, that we can borrow for them. And so it's just a matter of picking the ones that, uh, that we think would best suit. Uh, and then we can see if, I think modify them for this use case for our use cases and bake, and see if there's a good way we can bake them in easily. Uh, that being said, I I get the feeling as well that we have to be a bit careful with some protocols because some protocols may be sensitive to uh, <coughs> to to this thing as well. So, like there there may be a specific way that a certain protocol may deal with an error and pass that up. And if we could preempt that, you know that that would uh, uh, pretty, but if we can, if if we can follow those channels, that that would probably be better in some scenarios. So, uh, but basically, I'm, I'm I'm pretty aware about circuit breaking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we we developing our own applications, which has all this supervisor trees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But but it's always inside an application. So so from the principles are quite clear. You need to signal something uh, if, if right hand fails, you should signal that this has failed. And so, so the question here, if you're leaving your application environment, which you usually use, it might, might support that and say, hey, we have independent pods which are uh, uh, created in a, in a different uh, language, in a different environment. Uh, let's say you, are, you open up a, a, an IPsec on the right hand side using line of kernel and some shell scripts just to give an example and you're on the left hand side you have the running pod implemented in C or VPP doing another thing. So and, and no but this pods have a pass and has a connection maybe, maybe they have readiness probes, health probes, liveness probes so you need a coordinator somehow across yep, language yep. boundaries in, in the orchestration environment which tells the other one. Well I, let me let me 
let me ask you a question because you're, you're a good person to ask this question because you have a real problem, right? So one of the things that I've occasionally mused about um, is a possibility like the following, which is um, for situations in which the thing you're doing is effectively stateless, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm gonna say some things that may be untrue about your use case just for illustration. So feel, correct me at the end. Um, so say for example, that your, your, your left-hand CapWAP uh, CNF you know, it's getting a bunch of, uh, you know, data that's coming in as L2 frames that it wants to pass on to your gateway. Um, now, you may have five replicas of that gateway, um, and we happen to have routed your connection to one of them. Um, and since it's just a VXLAN connection, my presumption is that you don't have any magic state. You're just shoving frames at somebody who will then be able to shove them into an IPsec GRE tunnel to where they need to go. If you happen to connect, if we connect you at first to replica number one, and replica number one dies. We discover via live maintenance probe that it's gone. Maybe the node caught on fire, for God's sake, right? Um, you know, it strikes me that there are some scenarios in which just seamlessly and quietly connecting you to replica number two is probably doing you a favor. Um, and, and it seems we should be able to do that in NSM, um, quietly and seamlessly reconnect a stateless connection to um, another replica that provides the service you're looking for. Um, yeah. Is that something that would be useful to you? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the case. And I think usually uh, in, in mobile core protocols and even in the cup up, it's much simpler because the client makes a retry. So the request coming over anyway, uh, keeping the state and putting it to another stateless element would be even better. But that's more or less easy because uh, a failing pod knows he has failed and, uh, and so on. The problem is well, here is- sometimes, sometimes he knows he's failed. He knows he's failed for certain kinds of failures, right? So if uh, you're an example of, I can no longer, my IPsec tunnel is down on the gateway, then you know you mm -hmm. failed. But if, if you know, something went wonky on the physical server where your node is, mm -hmm. um, and so the node went down ungracefully and so the pod just disappeared, mm -hmm. um, then it strikes me that, you know, it would be a favor to you if you were truly stateless to when your CapWAP sends another, you know, basically sends another um, uh, frame, we just, you know, having realized that that one is gone, we put you onto a new VXLAN tunnel that takes you to another replica uh, and you continue to get service. And so instead of having to think inside the CapWAP server and do a lot of logic, um, essentially you get a very brief period where shit's just not working followed by shit working again and it just works, right? And so you it's get out like of you develop a packet or whatever it is. It looks like a packet drop or... Uh, yeah, it just looks like a, a blip of packet drop um, mm. followed by packet drop is no longer dropping. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And Kubernetes does provide some of the primitives that we can that we can rely on. So, for example, if it's a pod, if, if it's a pod, we can use uh, readiness and liveness probes to to control. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so my problem is basically, I have a liveness, readiness, or whatever other state from the application on one pod on the right hand side, and if this liveness or this, let's look on the picture we, 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 we shared um, again. Sure, sure. Do you want me to share it again? Or do you want to share it again? Uh, hang on a sec. Yep. I shared again, yeah. What, what did you oh, sorry, go on. If, if this part here, or is this connection, let's say, is failing, maybe not even because because the pod itself fails, but so the outer service, the other service, let's say this connection is not there anymore. This should lead to, I don't accept more frames on the left-hand side. Because otherwise they will send traffic and traffic and traffic and have the impression everything is right, but the state of this connection, it's, it's, it's gone. It is it's, it's actually, a practical use case, even even with, with with stock equipment at the moment, yeah, that this will still try to send traffic. Even you have a redundant second copy in another data center, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you because you don't know that this connection on the right hand side has been failed, they still put traffic in here. So basically, yeah, I mean, effectively, what, I, what you're saying what you're saying is. If for, so from, think about this from the point of view of the CapWAP pod, CNF. I find it very useful to think about local points of view. From the point of view of the, the, the CapWAP pod, it does not matter why the connection it has um, to a gateway service is not working, 
Like why it's not working is not its problem. If it is no longer a good connection, it needs to know that, right? Um, because it may have steps that it needs to take um, in order to behave properly. And in your case, you're saying this step is to refuse to accept more incoming wireless frames, which is fine. But, but I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in localizing intelligence wherever possible and limiting the need for global vision wherever possible. And so I, I think all the CapWap pod needs to know is I no longer have a connection to a gateway. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's what you can do. If you say, I'm not ready anymore because whatever the, 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 the reason for that is, let the CGW die as well, then I don't have a connection anymore and then I can't send traffic. Oh, so if the gateway for whatever reason um, is no longer showing as lively, um, which can include it declaring itself not lively because it's lost its outgoing connection, or could include, you know, somebody took a sledgehammer to the node it was on and that pod just isn't there anymore. Right? It doesn't matter which one, the NSM essentially notes that it has failed its liveliness check. And having failed its liveliness check, that means that we need to look at the connections it has and either um, notify the pod that they are gone or reconnect those connections to someone who is passing their liveliness check who provides the same network service that Gateway was providing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, like, yeah like the way that I'm looking at this, like there's, there's multiple areas and this, this would be, uh, something that whoever is designing this particular path would have to decide on. So like if the IPsec connection goes down, you know, is, is it possible for it to resolve the connection issues itself, open up a new IPsec channel and then silently deal with it? You know, and that's, that's one option. Another option would be to signal up, its upstream connection saying, I no longer have connectivity, uh, I'm going to go away now and you, Make a new request for a new con you, making the new request for a new connection or passing the error upstream would be the decision of the of the next hop up. Okay. So like in, in in essence that like the the the, the IP like imagine that the IPsec path itself uh, that you had there was like another NSM like that that connection that context of that con and and that connection it doesn't know anything about about what's uh, above it uh, other than the limited amount of state that's and metadata that's been passed to it and so it doesn't actually have the context to deal with it but the next hop up definitely or may have that context or the next one up from there so it's like you know you have to pass that information up until you get to a point where where so where something can make the decision like i want to re try to reconnect or we should fail up the entire uh, we should fail up. We should fail up the chain, and eventually, you you hit the uh, the customer where you might fail the connection. In worst case scenario, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. So I think like we, we still want to capture statistics on on all this stuff. Like if we see the IPsec uh, tunnels dying all the time, you know, we definitely want to know this. And so the tracing is still uh, is is still important. But like you said, orthogonal. But the actual decision itself, uh, to me, it it sounds like. Like we we want to we we want to hand the decision to whichever service has the best context to deal with that, and the I think the most effective way is to just keep handing it up until such a service is found and can make that decision. Yeah, it, it, it's almost analogous to how you throw exceptions up the line until you meet the person who actually knows what the fuck they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> propagation yeah, yeah. It's, I, I know it was just just an open discussion about how to do that the, the poor man's approach would be the IPsec pod is not ready anymore it loses the readiness if the IPsec tunnel goes down it's, it's still live but not ready and then if you can pro propagate I'm not ready or the readiness is it's gone then yeah this should be propagated and just so just so you know uh, good the the management channel that we're using at this particular point, uh, we've built up through protocol buffers the uh, the management path. Like, how do you make a new connection or so on? So, uh, one of the things that we need to build out as well is uh, is passing some of this uh, state information back up about about a connection. So we haven't added any primitives to that just just yet. But uh, like, I think this is exposing a hole in that in that area where like. It's not, it's, it's not that we didn't think about it, it's that we haven't, in our development cycle, it's, it's, on, the, it's on the agenda. <laughs> and, 
I am part of, so what we're using is we're using gRPC, which has a, uh, a dual, uh, it's a bi-directional uh, RPC mechanism. And so uh, in this particular scenario, it sounds like what we need to do is ensure that the, that there's a, some way that we can communicate this information to and from each, uh, each uh, service pod, I guess we'll call them, in order mm -hmm. to make sure that this, that this information can get prop propagated up and that it's understood what those error messages uh, uh, are and what they mean. And perhaps, mm -hmm. perhaps we, can, we, can, we may even be able to add a little bit of additional functionality as well. Like if the, if the client says, I want to connect to an IPsec network, uh, and that's handled by another network service mesh, and it dies. Uh, I mean, we could we could potentially even add some functionality functionality to say, hey, if this thing dies, don't even bother returning uh, returning back. Just try to connect to another one, and, and only return mm -hmm. to me if if that fails. And that, yeah, I mean that, that that's kind of my the point I was suggesting about the, the for stateless connections because. For a stateless connection, it's entirely possible the network service mesh itself can handle the error without disturbing the pod on the, the pod that has its connection to the, the network service that went away. Yeah, was. but ultimately, the the one who that decision needs to be made by that by the client requesting the service, and the client needs should specify that as I want one of my failure strategies to be to retry new connection on failure. No, that's absolutely true, right? I mean. Because the, 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 the client is the one who knows whether a reconnect on failure is going to be a problem or not, right? Um, you know, again, it's back to the, the, the local knowledge. Um, you know, CapWAP understands whether this is okay or not. And so it should indicate if that kind of thing is okay when it requests the connection. Right, and, and because it's on a per connection basis as well, that means that uh, you can have multiple connections from a, uh, from a single client. Uh, so that means that you could set up based upon your SLA requirements or so on exactly what you need. And even if it's the same data path, uh, perhaps one customer, you have a different recovery strategy because uh, of contractual obligations. And mm -hmm. that, could be, that could be added in to your, to your intent. So you can try to service it as best as possible. Exactly, that's, that's, that's what we, what we pr promote uh, anyway for other services as well. So in the intent, you already know this, SLAs, et cetera, et cetera, and, how, and that would drive some behavior. So I see that, and what I also like on that is this, this is not on the pair pod base from a, from, a, from a sidecar perspective, if you're doing that or it's ready or not, then we have it on a connection based. Yeah? So I say, okay, uh, this connection, fail from an SM perspective and have, have this information on this level and not on, let's say, a VPP port has failed or something as a global state. So a connection. Absolutely. The other thing that I would suggest to you, and it sounds like you're already starting to think this way, is one of the things that I found really profound here is the very dynamic nature of these L2 and L3 connections in network service mesh opens a whole world of possibility that we just haven't thought of before because the world was too static. Right, so what, is it useful, for example, to have a connection per client, right, coming out of your CapWAP? Mm -hmm. You know, why I don't, not? yeah, why not? I mean, you know, it, it's unthinkable in the way we used to do things. Like you literally couldn't have imagined it. Um, That's exactly what's happening with soft GRE, soft GRE where I say per client, you make a, make a soft GRE connection, which is not pre-configured, you're just bringing it up because mm -hmm. this 12 clients needs to go to another hub as, as the other ones. And as you can establish them dynamically, um, um, that's entirely possible. And it wasn't before. That was over CNI only possible at bring up time and not, not on, on, uh, at, at runtime anymore. So it's, Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Cool, so we, we've run fabulously over, but I think very productively so. Um, we look forward to having you guys get more involved in the community going forward. Um, and thank you so much for bringing this use case, particularly on a four minutes notice, because I think it's been a very productive one. Okay. Yeah, and, and just to circle back to your first question is to, in, in terms of involvement, like uh, I think it, it may be a little bit too early for junior developers who want to implement a 
service to jump in at this particular time. I mean, if they want to help with building out the network service mesh, you know, we have plenty of tasks and and part of what I want to do is is help people, you know, even if they're very junior to to learn how to contribute and, and be effective uh, contributors. Uh, if you have the bandwidth to help build this out, fantastic. If you don't have the bandwidth to, to help build it out, you know, the use cases alone are, are invaluable. So, you know, so don't, don't feel bad if, if you don't, if you don't have that at this particular time. Um, timelines, I, I don't have a good answer that to, to the timeline at this particular, at this particular moment. Um, other than, you know, this is a, to me, this is a high priority. I want to get this up and running as fast as possible, but I, have to, I want to temper that with making sure that we get it right. So that's, that's why I can't really commit to say, hey, you know, this should be usable by October or November or like a sort of specific date. So, uh, so, so I apologize about not, not having something concrete on, on, on sure. that side. Mm -hmm. uh, but it means from a, from a time being, from a current state, the environment is not even usable. It's just about defining the APIs at the moment, or is this already user in a very limited scope? And, and can, you, can you push a packet from A to B already? That's a question. Uh, even so, as, much, uh, as you imagine in the long run. Yeah, so we haven't built out the, uh, so we're, we're targeting uh, VPP as one of the, as the first, um, as the first SDN at, at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't built the backend for that just yet. So there's no, there's no okay. packet. So mm -hmm. that, so that's, that's where we're at. So from a production perspective, um, I mean, unless you're willing to build out such a, such a component, uh, it's not really, it's it's not really ready yet. Uh, right now, we, we we do have the capability to push uh, information into uh, network service mesh in terms of some of yeah. the intent and some of the state, and uh, we're doing that through what's called Kubernetes uh, CRDs. So uh, CRD is basically an extension to the Kubernetes API. Okay, and so so we're going through the CRD path in in that scenario, but. Uh, we also have some protocol buffers that have been spec that have been added out. We have co-generated uh, where we have a service that's that's up and running uh, and is injecting things into queues, but there's nothing on the other side of those queues yet. So we're so we're so we're still in the process of, of actively building out the core functionality. So so I mean the the the, the next thing I would say is that there, there there's some placeholders right now for the APIs. Don't take them too seriously. We just needed something as a placeholder. We're building yeah. up the infrastructure to be able to handle those APIs. Um, and and I, my, my suspicion is that once that infrastructure is in place, there will be some rapid iteration getting very serious about those APIs that will occur. Um, you know, because yeah. they're... Mm -hmm. and, and, what, and part of what is, what's going to happen as well is that once, once we're happy with the data injection, we're, we're just about done with, with that particular path uh, on, in terms of the CRDs, uh, being written. So the next uh, the next step immediately after that is let's start building out a VPP provider and uh, demonstrating demonstrating it. And so uh, so we should have the ability to push packets very soon, especially with the expertise that we have and the and the res and the access to resources that we have uh, in the team, uh, including uh, including Ed with that. Um, and so. So we'll we'll have something. We should have something relatively quick, barring any major stoppers that that we find. But okay. yeah, it's not it's not quite it's not not ready to be to be demoed actively at, at this point. Yeah. One one other thing I will mention to you, which is the way NSM looks at the actual CNFs, they, they you can sort of divide them into two classes immediately. There are what you might call from NSM's point of view the smart CNFs. These are the CNFs that are intelligent enough to participate in the conversation with the NSM. Um, and then there are what you might call the dumb CNFs. These are the CNFs that are not smart enough to participate in the conversation with the NSM. They expect a static set of interfaces presented to them. Um, and for those, we intend to write an init container that would take a config map that would set up whatever the dumb CNF needs. It sounds like you guys are wanting to be smart CNFs. Yeah, I think we uh, def definitely at will end up there. It's basically like building smart cloud native applications or doing uh, a parser and a startup 
Yeah. I, I totally get it. And I'm happy you guys want to be smart CNS. Uh, the reason we have to make sure we support both is we get a lot of feedback from uh, some of the larger operators basically saying, but our vendor ZNFs, they aren't even dumb yet. Um, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a SF, it's, a, it's like a SFC proxy in a service function chaining thing. Yeah, you either have an NSH aware VNF uh, or or you need to have a so a SFC proxy and do that. So I think they, both is there. But uh, as you see with the Open VNF group already or organization, we are about the VNF self. So basically, we see us as a VNF or CNF provider so we can make them as smart as we want there is no there, there is no vendor cnf there is no uh, there shouldn't be a vendor cnf there uh, uh, so because uh, we are about to build the vnf obviously if something comes in which needs in in a system integration perspective if you say hey but we have this vendor uh, cnf or vnf still here then from system integration perspective, okay, this can be represented by an interface. But if you talk about our own CNFs and VNFs, they would always be smart, and they are already as they con consuming directly Kubernetes resources. They uh, uh, pushing matrix out as uh, Prom Prometheus format, so they they do all the cloud native things already. And awesome. if, if it's possible, they do NS NSM, of course as well. So otherwise, it doesn't make sense to have a CNF at all. From, it's a VNF then. Absolutely. Really quick, when you were talking about a plug fest, was that the OPNFE plug fest or a different plug fest? No, no, it's nothing. It's a, it's a local, it's a local uh, research project, which is uh, state funded here. And it's about bringing up, uh, and that's about the partners creating, creating a plug fest uh, for themselves. Uh, six partners, universities, and other vendors, Etc. Is, is, very okay. is, is there something I could Google to find out more about it? Yeah, I can. Can it's similar? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So and at Open NFV, we we have not much contact. Uh, we we have contacted Dan Cohen about two, one and a half year ago uh, 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 and do. A lot of circumstances, uh, we lost a little bit of traction here because of uh, real projects to deliver. But uh, uh, we, we like to influence or work with OpenNFV as well, but we don't like to orchestrate OpenStack or so. It should be, it should be native. Yeah. And... <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. All right, cool. <laughs> I do have to run. It has been such a pleasure, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have to have a run as well. So thank you guys. I think it was a pleasure to, to, to meet you. And we, we, Anton, we get forward from here and discuss what that would mean for us. And thanks a lot for all the information. Yeah, yep. thanks for stopping by at such a short notice. And just so you know, Ed, I had a conversation with him about 10 hours ago for the first time. And um, I saw, I saw. Um, <laughs> that's, why, that's why I poked him. Um, you know, because I, I saw your conversation when you, where you poked me. So I do appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. So we definitely appreciate, you know, short notice and the amount that you've done up to this point, you know, it's uh, strongly appreciated. And with that, uh, th thank, thank you both. And uh, uh, you both have a good, uh, a good day, or in your case, uh, a good afternoon or night. Yeah, we have a good weekend. So, yeah. Okay. And see you on IRC then, guys. Definitely. Take care. Take care.